Hello, AP World History students. Welcome to part three of units three and four review. I'm going to go really fast because I do not want to make another video. Um, so first of all, social and cultural effects of the Spanish in the New World, uh, it, particularly in uh, Central or Mexico and South America. Uh, the, the Spanish, what they try to do is actually recreate European cities. Um, and part of this is uh, the construction of haciendas, which are like um, estates with large buildings and um, servants. And um, also in Spanish society, Spanish American society, we see uh, a huge growth of missions. Missionaries uh, from the Roman Catholic Church become uh, a really prominent in Spanish America. Um, and there was a vision of the Virgin Mary in 1531 by a, a man, a local man, and um, this led to pilgrimages to the area that he had the vision, and the Catholic faith actually has quite explosive growth in Spanish America. But it is a syncretic form of religion, and in fact, the vision of the Virgin, she's called the Virgin of Guadalupe, and she is an image that you will see in many Spanish American churches. Um, the Costa system was actually a codified racial classification system of mixed race children. Many of the men from, uh, the, from the Iberian Peninsula or Spain and Portugal did not bring women and so they would marry either slave women or indigenous women. And you can see from this poster here, and you can probably remember from class, that depending on how much Iberian is in a child, that would determine their social status. So here we have 16 different cast, so to speak, and eventually that will even become a more complex system. Um, moving to Africa, so the Portuguese first begin their um, interaction with King Afonso, who does uh, convert to Christianity, Christianity, but uh, the Portuguese are coming in and they're trying to find slaves. So they basically go up the Congo River, and uh, the Congolese provide slaves for the Portuguese, sell them, and then they bring their slaves uh, to various places that we'll talk about in just a minute. Eventually, the kingdom of Nadanga would become the first colony in Africa, um, in Angola. And you may recall Queen Nzinga was the ruler that was there when they were taken over and, by the Portuguese. And she did continue to fight to the end of her life for um, the uh, people for 40 years. So she is kind of an interesting story. But let's talk about really the most um, significant point here with the European interaction with Africa at this time in history, and that is the triangular trade. So the Portuguese actually begin the slave trade in West Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa by the 1520s, but it won't take long before most of Europe is involved in the Atlantic slave trade. So basically what they're looking for is labor for plantation economies in the New World. So keep in mind, most of the indigenous people had died from uh, smallpox. So something called the triangular trade occurred. So I'm going to go through the three parts of this. First of all, you have Europe right here bringing many manufactured goods down to West Africa. These are things like um, guns and rum. Africans trade the goods for slaves. So they go inland, they kidnap slaves, they bring them to the coast, then they bring them to the islands where uh, there are a few islands out here where they get them ready for passage across the Atlantic. Um, the uh, Africans will then go from Africa over to the Americas. Now many, many will go to Brazil as well. That's not on this um, this particular map, but they will end up anywhere around the coast of both North and South America. It's estimated that 20 to 30 million people were transported in the African slave trade. We have no idea really how to count that though. I mean, we have some estimates based on records that were kept and millions died at sea. I remember my African history teacher telling me if you emptied out the Atlantic Ocean, you would see a trail of bones from Africa to the Americas because of the number of uh, slaves that died at sea. So then from America, we have raw materials, a much that coming from uh, the Caribbean, from South America, and from North America, we have things like sugar. A lot of that is in, in the um, Caribbean. Cotton uh, is growing in, in uh, North America. Uh, tobacco and other cash crops uh, is a lot of sugar in Brazil, by the way, as well. And these are sent to Great Britain, where they are made into manufactured goods. What is the overall impact of the slave trade? Well, it's huge. Now, 
overall, we're going to have population growth in Africa during this time because of the Columbian Exchange. But slave regions do increase in imbalance of females because most of the slaves brought over from Africa were males. Um, now, the exception to this um, is in North America, there were plantation economies where uh, females were brought and uh, males and females had children and they grew their slave populations through uh, natural ways. Um, polygamy develops in parts of West Africa where um, many, many males have been kidnapped. Um, we've got more guns go to African slavers who are not really, uh, really good people actually, and this uh, leads to more violence in Africa. All right, the African diaspora, here you can see a better map of where slaves are coming from and where they go to. And I do want to mention that there is also a Muslim slave trade that took about 20 million people from the east coast of Africa into parts of the Arabian Peninsula, as well as into India. Um, the African diaspora brings food, music, religion to the Americas. There's a lot of syncretism that occurs between uh, Christianity, and other religions uh, across the world because of the African diaspora. All right, tradition and change in East Asia. So the Ming have been replaced by the Qing. This means pure. They claim the mandate of heaven. This will be China's last dynasty. It will end in 1911. Um, the Qing dynasty come from Manchuria. So they're a little bit north of uh, Xi'an or Chang'an, the ancient capital of China. Um, they preserved their own identity and language when they came down. They occupied the imperial city, which is in Beijing. And the generals of the Qing dynasty actually orchestrated mass killings of Han Chinese. That's the ethnic majority in China. And they forced the Manchu hairstyles and culture and the Chinese as acts on the Han Chinese as acts of a sign of submission. Um, so China is still, its products are still highly in demand. People love their luxury goods, their silk, their porcelain, their lacquerware, their tea is all superior to anything that anyone has been able to create anywhere else. Um, so uh, the Chinese, they still don't want foreigners coming in. Uh, they don't care about foreign goods. They have plenty of people for agriculture and for to the manufacture of their goods. And so what they want is silver and silver will become the Chinese currency. Chinese culture, uh, the importance of the civil service exams is elevated. And this becomes a way to move up in your status in Chinese society. You can take something called the eight legged essay. And if you have enough money to get tutored, of course you might even do better. Uh, but the scholar bureaucrats and only a few, uh, a small minority actually gain um, uh, entrance into the scholar gentry who are gonna help run the Qing dynasty, but they earn a very high status in society. We have continuing filial piety and patriarchy and foot binding in particular, a very, very painful process. But what it did was it, if you were bound, if your feet were bound, it showed that you didn't need to work out in the fields and it indicated a level of status in society and made you more marriageable. Now, Japan, um, the Tokugawa Ieyasu uh, sort of brings some unity to Japan. There have been a lot of fighting the, uh, amongst the daimyo, the shoguns. Of course, we have the samurai culture. And Tokugawa Ieyasu establishes the Bukufu, or tent government. This is meant to be temporary. As you can see, it wasn't. The emperor at this time becomes a figurehead, doesn't really have any power. He's kind of like one of those bottleheads who just sits there and does nothing. Now, that will change. Uh, in the uh, late 1800s, um, as we'll see uh, later on. Um, they really are promoting native learning, uh, Japanese identity, especially the practice of Shintoism, and Christian missionaries, they're trying to get into Japan. And you know what, they do have some conversions, okay? But then, whoa, um, the East became really, really bad news for people that were Christians. Uh, there was a harsh repression of the Christian faith that had to renounce their faith or they suffered very painful torture and death. And I'm not gonna describe the techniques right now, just take my word for it, it was painful. Um, finally, we have the Islamic empires or what we call the gunpowder empires. Now these are noted by their cultural conservatism. They wanted to protect exempt Islamic empires from the influence of the West. Nevertheless, they yielded great power and influence throughout the region that they occupied, which you can see on this map here. So I start from going from West 
to east. We have the Ottomans here. They're mostly in Anatolia, but they almost get to Vienna. So um, this would have been a very um, interesting thing if uh, the Ottomans had taken over Vienna, but they did not. They used a system called Janissaries in which they took young Christian boys at about the age of seven in the called, it, this was called the Devsturm system, and they trained them to be very loyal to the emperor. Now they were, um, uh, Sunni, or to the Caliph rather, not the Emperor. The Safavids, this was an empire in what is uh, now uh, modern day Iran, um, it's in Southwest Asia, and it was what was ancient Persia. They practiced a particular brand of Islam called Twelver Shiism. And in Twelver Shiism, uh, the Shias believe that there, the Twelver Shias believe that there is a 12th Imam who is in hiding, and one day he will come out of hiding. And that is their, their prophecy. They use Persian administrative techniques. If we go back to Persia, you know that they had the um, the system of uh, a bureaucracy that was in administrative districts. Um, and then we have the Mughals. That name is derived from the term Mongol. These are in northern India, um, and you can see them here. Uh, first, we have Babur, who takes over northern India, and then Akbar, his grandson. And they were pretty religiously tolerant. Now, remember, there are a lot of Hindus in India. Um, and so this religious toleration, uh, and especially with Akbar, created this divine faith, which combined elements of Islam and Hinduism, and which would later on uh, lead to a form of Sikhism, which is actually also a, a syncretic blend of Islam and Hinduism. And then we have Aurangzeb, who tried to extend uh, Mughal rule to southern India. He was not religiously tolerant, and he t did tax the Hindus um, and persecuted them. So, circling back to unit four, three, uh, unit three and four key concepts. Think about the interaction of the eastern and western hemispheres made possible by those transoceanic voyages and the things that they led to, like the Atlantic slave trade, like the Columbian Exchange. Think about the knowledge of them, the scientific learning and technology that comes from the classical Islamic and Asian worlds, um, such as the astrolabe and um, astronomy, mathematics. I didn't talk about that, but that was something else that came. Uh, think about the different forms of empire we see at this time, the constitutional monarchies, the absolute monarchies, the dy dynasties, imperial dynasties, such as we see in China. And then major changes in agriculture and systems and locations of manufacturing, gender and social structures and environmental processes. I know I talked really fast during this episode, but I finished in three. Yay. Remember, um, the most important thing to do is uh, to go back into your notes and make sure that you can see the thread of history, these common themes that we see throughout history, and then be able to fill in some details so that when it comes to the point of including outside evidence in your essay, whatever the topic may be, you can you can search your mind, you can brainstorm, and you can come up with some specific evidence that will help support the thesis of your essay. Thank you very much for your attention to these videos, and good luck on the AP exam.